You guys want to throw us out? Good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Steves, and it's my privilege to be the director of the DePaul Humanity Center. I'm pleased to welcome you to the next installment in our year-long series, Condemnation, Justice, Prison, Punishment, Persecution. As we discuss the ethical imperative of prison abolition and the goals of punishment in general with our very special guest, Sister Helen Grishon. I'll introduce Sister Helen more appropriately in a few minutes, but before we begin in earnest, I'd like to suggest a few possible questions and issues that might possibly help frame some of our considerations this evening, <coughs> though we're happy, of course, to see the conversation move in the direction that both Sister Helen and all of you wish, as we'll have ample time for the audience to join in with your questions in the last half hour or so of the evening in a conversation that I'm going to be happy to be moderating. So I begin then by hoping that you had a chance to visit the exhibits in the entrance to the Commons earlier tonight, all having to do with Stateville Correctional Center, a maximum security men's prison that's part of the Illinois Department of Corrections located just outside of Chicago. We tried to give you a bit of the sensory experience of being in that prison, though of course this was an utterly impossible task from the get-go. Still, it was important to us that we try our best to make folks aware of the experiential conditions we're agreeing to let someone live under when incarcerated, even knowing that this would not really be possible in any true, visceral way. And we wanted to treat this, and the men about whom we're speaking, with the respect that's due. That is, not turning it somehow into a sideshow of horrors, but instead just making it more real, more transparent and suggesting what life inside the physical space of the prison might be like. I apologize for any and all inadequacies, and I hope that somehow there were glimmers of truth that sneaked out. Those moments of truth are no doubt due to the creativity and generosity of those who contributed, especially Lloyd de Grain, who graciously allowed us to display his photos taken inside Stateville, and importantly, the display of letters from men currently incarcerated at Stateville. Um, Dominica Kimberly Moe, whom you'll meet in a few minutes, put the letter display together with her students, and the display itself was based on a detailed design created by Terry, who currently is in the state of So we're grateful to Lloyd, Kim, Kim's students, Terry, and all the letter writers who helped make this exhibit possible. We chose Stateville as our focus in the exhibit tonight, not because it's in any way a model, that is, neither a model of a good or a bad prison, whatever that might mean, but simply because it's close to Chicago, part of our community, and because DePaul has certain institutional relationships with it. Our focus, of course, is not to talk about state bill per se this evening, but we thought that it might be helpful to have something concrete to start our conversation, rather than simply talking about prisons in the abstract. I'll raise some abstract questions about prisons now to set the stage for the evening, but I think that it's important to remember that there's never really anything abstract about these discussions. Real people, whose lives matter, are always hanging in the balance. And so, to put it most basically, why do we think we need prison? The standard answer would be twofold, I imagine. Most would say that we need prisons in order to protect us from further crime and to punish criminals for their past crimes. The prison, that is, is seen as both a settlement outside of our community where we can keep people who might otherwise harm us, and a site and even a means for inflicting punishment on those we have decided to have violated the social contract and thus deserve to be harmed in some way. We use the prison physically to remove the criminal from our midst and to punish him in the process. These two goals need not be complementary. They might even be at odds. But there's a shared ideology at work, I think, that might be worth our thinking about together. We have at our disposal a variety of ways to begin investigating this ideology and all of the assumptions that drive it. We might, for instance, talk about the racial and economic prejudices that enter into our current state of mass incarceration. Or we might think about the ways in which other institutions, such as schools, might mirror and even feed the cultural forces that create as the prison system strives to create, docile and subservient bodies. In fact, our two final Humanity Center events in this series will take up these specific questions on May 8th and May 12th. Perhaps you can join us again that evening. Or we might instead investigate the way in which capitalism has a stake in making us committed to prisons. How the prison system is profit-making, 
And we, as a culture, tend to believe that whatever leads to monetary profit must be good for the society at large. Therefore, we naively accept that prisons are necessary for justice, but in fact, they're mostly just good for making money. Or, in our attempt to understand and critique this ideology and our assumption that we need prisons, we might look at the history of how other cultures have managed to pursue the goal of justice without the presence of jails or prisons. And here, we might note countless examples of such societies, from traditional Jewish collectives to almost all tribal and indigenous societies, to modern day examples as well. Sweden, by the way, has a population of 9.6 million people, and they currently only have 4,500 incarcerated. Their goal is to go lower, to tear down the last prisons that they have. Or, we might begin by asking about the ways in which abolitionists and abolitionist projects have certain commitments in common that might reflect helpfully on one another. How, for instance, death penalty abolition and prison abolition might have a fruitful dialogue. Luckily for us, one of the strongest and most eloquent voices on death penalty abolition ever is with us tonight. Or finally, we might ask about the way in which justice itself is conceptualized in a liberal, individualistic society such as ours, and thus how we conceptualize crime and the idea of the criminal as well. Indeed, within this latter approach is hidden, I think, a key assumption that we might wish to consider. For it seems to me that one of the most fruitful ways in which we might begin the dialogue is to begin to examine the notions of individuality and community, their work in our prison culture, and our desire to incarcerate. Crime harms communities. Individuals suffer too, of course, but to focus merely on the individual is to assume that the nature of crime is to have one individual person doing something bad to another individual. No one is born a criminal, of course. Violence, alienation, hopelessness, anger, greed, callous self-interest, despair, all of the other ingredients that drive someone to harm another take root in a social setting. Crime takes place within a community, and it harms a community. Furthermore, in a true community, no one can be reduced to a label. In our current society, our concepts end up doing the thinking for us. We call someone a prisoner, and that person is instantly not many other things. We don't even have to think about it anymore. He or she is not human, a person, a citizen, a community member. The desire to harm someone, whether it's the offender's desire or our desire to harm that offender back, is only possible when that person, that other, is not taken to be deeply related to me, my responsibility, a community member with whom I necessarily share a common good, but instead is taken to be radically separate. How did we get to a place where it was even possible to see someone right beside me as so separate, isolated, and cut off? How did we get to a point where we might think that prisons are appropriate when it's clear that prisons harm us in the plural? They harm families by means of the loss of fathers, sons, sources of income, and social standing. They harm communities by loss of friends, co-workers, potential role models, potential leaders. Removing one person changes the whole lot of us. We become less. And this is not even to begin to address the question of why we might wish to harm someone, to see them aside. When you think about it, a prison is a strange sort of institution, more of a chance to throw away a person than to address any real question of justice. Colonial and imperialist nations often set up liberal colonies in order to ship off those they have labeled as criminals. My Australian friends, for instance, never tire of hearing about their history as a female colony. With most of the land in the world now claimed by superpowers, We've had to turn to the state and to corporations to create penal colonies in our suburbs, urban ghettos, rural dumping grounds. The sentiment is the same. And this is a peculiar response to a communal problem. Out of sight, out of mind, out of a true conception of justice by being placed into the so-called criminal justice system. The Christian response, I think, is to see us as in community first. To take the kingdom of heaven to be spread upon the earth, though men do not see it. To see us all in this together, refusing to turn anyone away. Refusing to cast not only the first stone, 
but refusing to stand so far apart from others that we even have any space to think about throwing stones. The secular response, too, has a rich history of communitarian thought to call into question the liberal social contract notions of Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, and all the rest that begin with a radically individual notion of the self, and thus an individualistic notion of crime and punishment. And so, perhaps we might keep such questions in the back of our minds this evening. Questions concerning what we mean by crime and justice in the first place when we believe that prisons play a role in either. Before we begin that discussion with our keynote speaker, I'd like to share with you one additional guess and one quick story. The story that I'll read to you will be one written by a man currently being held in the Stateville Correctional Center. And the woman I'd like to bring to the stage now is someone who knows this man, has taught him and worked with him, and is going to offer us just a couple of minutes of her general reflections on having spent time as a regular visitor to the prison. She, and the program of which she's a part, are a great asset to the university and the myriad people that they benefit. I'm pleased to introduce to you an instructor in Nepal's Departments of Philosophy and Community Service Studies, Dominica Kimberly Lowe. Labeled 
prisoner, inmate, criminal, are not at all what they thought that they would be. They soon find that the inside classmates are nothing like the scary monsters they somehow expected to meet. After getting to know their incarcerated classmates, the DePaul students begin to unravel their own deep and almost unconscious assumptions about anyone touched by the criminal justice system. I also began to see, after teaching these courses inside of prison, my own previously unrealized, seemingly impenetrable stance of people housed in prison and jails. And now I can't stop seeing it. Everything. This fervent attitude. My question is then, what is this punishing attitude of ours all about? And what makes it so strong, so unavoidable, so inescapable? And why do we find it so interesting, thrilling? Some of our Supreme Court justices, like Justice Scalia, as Sister Helen Prejean tells us in The Death of Innocence, strongly believes that punishment is a divine command especially in Romans 13, which states, for he, the he here being the rulers of the government, is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For if he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that with evil. For, my, for Michel Foucault, on the other hand, in his most magnificent text, Discipline and Punish, with this photograph is featured in the midst of it, um, catches sight of our thinking of punishment as an, un an unalterable fate in the transition of punishment as a spectacle of public torture and execution to a much more regimented, sanitized, hidden kind of punishment behind bars. <clears throat> to put it very briefly, Foucault tells us that during the second half of the 18th century in France, people began to protest against public executions. People began to see torture and executions as another kind of crime, a worse crime event, wherein, I quote, the executioner resembled the criminal, judges, murderers, and the tortured criminal, an object of pity and admiration. The public execution was now seen as a heart in which violence bursts again into blame. Thus, punishment moved slowly out of public view into the penitentiary, transitioning into a more subtle, more subdued suffering. Yet, although punishment, and by punishment, I mean that engineered, engineered pain and suffering, Intentional infliction of pain and suffering 
on humans, by humans, is unacceptable to us. I believe we have an aversion to this delib deliberate administration of pain and suffering onto fellow human beings. So, like public torture and execution, we, on some level, also find prison <coughs> reprehensible, especially in our day of mass incarceration. This tension, this conflict, leads us then into a kind of state of denial. That is, a denial of the humanness, the value, I mean the worthiness of those touched by prison. We consider people in prison not as people, but as animals, monsters, as morally insensitive, incapable of change. I, I was going to tell you a little, little story. Um, uh, the other day, and when I was at a prison, I'm not going to say which one, um, but they do visit, and there's some green day, green day too. Um, but, so I was talking to uh, a chaplain, and we were talking about rights, the worthiness, and um, I said, you know, the guys at the prison who live here, they're really at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to any rights. And the chaplain responded to me and said, responded to me saying that they didn't exist at all. And so people, people who work inside the prison see very well how those who live there are thought of. Um, and I don't know how much experience you, you have all had inside prisons or jails or juvenile facilities. But if you have, you know that prison as a form of punishment isolates people, takes away the possibility of enacting any kind of responsibility for themselves or others. It takes away everyone and everything one holds dear, uses constant surveillance as a way to get people to police themselves. Prison takes away one's dignity, not by, by not in one moment of privacy, not even to use a toilet. In some places, two men stay in a seven by nine cell 24 hours a day, wherein the lights never are turned off and the loud, muffling, muffled sounds of human suffering never ceases. And one does not need a life sentence to be sentenced to a life of punishment. After prison, when people pay their so-called debt to society, their punishment does not end. People who have been incarcerated cannot receive public benefits like food stamps, public housing, they can't receive any financial aid. Many schools and universities, not mentioning any names, will not even allow these people um, who have been convict, con convicted of a felony into their halls. Unemployment is excruciatingly difficult, as many applications still have the check the box on, on them. And there's so many other reasons, there's so many other things professional licenses they can't have, etc. And some people are even thought of as criminal before they do anything. Poor folks and people of color stigmatized, black men in ghetto communities, and many who live in middle class communities are targeted by police at early ages, often before they're old enough to vote, they're routine, routinely stopped, frisked, and searched without reasonable suspicion or probable cause. Eventually, they're arrested, whether they've committed a serious crime or not, and branded criminals and felons for life, as Michelle Alexander so eloquently tells us all about in her very famous book, The Nugent Pearl. 
I would like to invite us all to reflect on this idea of the necessity of punishment. Can we imagine another way to deal with crime, another way to deal with harm? Can we, can we possibly fantasize about something else? I would also like us to reconsider who we feel is deserving of punishment. In closing, I wonder what would happen if I could bring you all inside prison. There, I'm sure you could see for yourself the torture of incarceration. In fact, I would very much like to do this. I would like to bring punishment back to the public sphere. Also, and also by doing it, to demystify it. And it's titillating elements also that we enjoy on crime shows and even news broadcasts. And I bet if you spent time with the people inside, it's because I'm looking at my students, that's what makes me fun. Got to know them face to face. You would, you would experience a shift in perception too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. And now I'd like to read you a very short, short story. And we do this so that the voices of those about whom we're speaking tonight can be present here in some sense. And because this very thoughtful, well-written short story in particular might help set the stage for us to think together about what it means to do time in prison. This is a story written by stateful resident Michael Carlos, entitled, Time. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. As the choir takes their seats, my father steps to the microphone in the pulpit. Praise the Lord, he says. Congregation responds. Praise the Lord. The purposes of God, my friends, often develop slowly because his grand designs are never hurried. This is the time in the service when I slip down in the pew and fall asleep. I don't think my father ever really knew I was sleeping during his sermons. I mean, he never said anything about it. As I drift off into a deep, deep sleep, my father's words become faint till no more. Then suddenly, I'm awakened to the sound of MedTech on two gallery. Someone shouts. MedTech is short for medical technician, meaning someone is in need of immediate help. More and more people join in calling MedTech on two gallery, MedTech on two gallery. My eyes are fully open and I realize my reality. I'm not in church, but in prison. Man, that dream seems so real. Ned Tech on two gallery. People are hollering at the top of their lungs, and now people are starting to bang on the top of their cell doors. My mind starts to drift back to the same type of scene years ago when a man needed medical assistance, and men were hollering and banging in this same type of way. It's this feeling of deja vu, and that scared me. I remember he died from heart attack. I jump up. I rush to the cell door. I start yelling, Med Tech on two gallery! I hear several keys moving in the lower gallery. The hollering has stopped. I hear more keys moving faster than normal. Then I hear someone yell, hurry up! I know this is a serious scene. I used to escape this reality with substance, a little weed, a little drink, which got me numb to all those around me. But not so much anymore. I feel everything now. I sit down on this hard bunk, no TV, no radio, just me. One ear is still listening to the abnormal sounds of the scene downstairs. But out of the corner of my eye, I see something. I zero in on this something, and it's a cockroach. It's 
It's making its way up the wall. I just stare at it. I wonder, what might it be if I would be this small creature? Is it free, or is it incarcerated like me? I usually smash on the cockroaches I see. In my mind, it's a deterrent to let the others know not to come around. But this one, I let live. I lay back and just watch the roach disappear into a hole in the wall. My eyes start to close for one brief moment. I'm mowing someone's lawn on a very hot day. I have shorts and a tank top on. My shoes are covered with grass stains. The air smells like fresh cut flowers, grass, the smell of summertime. Cars are driving by, hurrying to wherever they're headed. I hear loud music playing from the distance and it's getting closer and closer. I hear my father's voice call out, Mike, come in the house, hurry up. I turn, I see him standing on the porch. I realize the grass I'm cutting is the family lawn. I turn the mower off and make my way to the porch, but before I make it, I trip. My one foot is in some hole in the ground. I'm falling, but before I hit the ground, I open my eyes. I'm in prison. It's gotten dark out. How long was I asleep? I take a deep breath and sit up on the side of the bunk. I hear men in the galleries talking. Some of the men are angry with their words, and it's quickly apparent to me that the man that needed medical assistance has died. Another tragic death could have been avoided. Death is surely certain. No one wants to die here, mentally or physically. Could this be my fate? My father's voice still echoes in my mind. I wonder if my reality is crawling through the hole in the wall as the cockroach did, escape to freedom. Or should I have listened more and not to my father? It is a true honor to introduce to you this evening Sister Helen Prejean, CSJ, educator, activist, and best-selling author of Dead Men Walking. Sister Helen is internationally known as an advocate for the abolition of the death penalty, and her tireless work in this area has inspired conversation, conversion, and change on both a personal and an institutional scale. Drawing attention to the immorality of capital punishment and the way in which individuals, the state, and the culture at large relate to those being imprisoned and sentenced to death. A member of the Congregation of St. Joseph, Sister Helen began her prison ministry in 1981, and her passionate, compassionate, yet well reasoned words have reached literally millions of people around the world, sending out ripples that have affected countless lives for the better. Whether you're hearing Sister Helen speak for the first time this evening or for the hundredth time, you can be assured that you too will be thinking in new ways by evening's end. DePaul is incredibly lucky to have a special relationship with Sister Helen, and to have her here tonight to speak about abolitions of all sorts, and the morality of incarceration and prison punishment in general, it's a great honor for us at the Humanity Center. Friends, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Sister Helen Prishon. Professional card he has printed. 
If you have come here to help me, no thanks. If you come here because you realize your liberation is tied to mine, well. So what has, what do the people in prison have to do with us in our liberation? Of course, we have agency. We have agency to get in a car and drive a car. We have agency to take a course and not take a course. We have an agency to wait and do our homework at the last minute, or we can do it at the beginning and have it all done and have the weekend free. We have agency. We have freedom. We make choices. We have resources. We have options. And imagine that life confined into that cell. Imagine that life with the gate clicking behind you with the words of the judge ringing in your ear, go and serve for the rest of your life, or 50 years, or 40 years, that you're to be incarcerated. And how do you reach that spark of human freedom and dignity that I am a person? I am somebody. The gift that has been given to me by all the years that I have gone to death row and visited people in prison has been the gift of humanness and what happens when we leave the world behind, go in with a human being that everybody else considers disposable human waste, get in the prison, sit down, and visit with this human being for two hours or whatever it is, no other distractions, all you have is each other. And that is the gift of these 30 or so years of prison visitation with real human beings. Don't ask me how it gets decided, who I'm with, I don't even know myself. But I know that I've accompanied six human beings who've been executed in front of my eyes. And I know with a man on death row right now in the Louisiana State Prison, Manuel Ortiz, going on 23 years on death row, who is absolutely innocent. And I know this, that I will fight with every inch of life and resources I have to get him the lawyers and what he needs to fight for his freedom. Not simply to resign myself to his death in that prison and that we kill people, but that we must resist. And we must find an alternative way to prison. We're throwing everybody away. It's now 2.4 million people in prison, the biggest incarcerated in the world. Will we ever be in prison? Will we ever be all of a sudden have the handcuffs around our hands and be thrown into a cell? Thrown in with all kinds of people, never have privacy again, never have agency again, to be able to learn, to be able to move, to be able to travel. It's highly unlikely because we are among the privileged ones of our society. Every single one of us in the years. And let me just take you a little bit into the awakening in my own soul. And I'm still grateful to God in my way. I could have lived my whole life in prison. I could have been a good nun, I could have taught people, you know, include seventh and eighth grade boys, brown, the semicolon, and not be given a rule. I could have been kind, compassionate, been a great nun. But I awakened to the deeper call of the gospel of Jesus that I sense the Vincentians have and is present here at the call. And it goes back to the spirit of St. Vincent of Paul and being on those streets in France when the whole society was in shambles, when war had happened, people were on the street. And our situation is similar. But the people are hidden from us. The people in the inner city that we don't come in contact with are hidden from us. So I'll tell you some stories that kind of bring you into the heart of things. This book, Dead Men Walking, is the first part of the journey. This was about awakening to the gospel call to justice and moving into the St. Thomas housing projects and for the first time seeing the other America. Me, a white woman of privilege, growing up in the deep south, 
a daddy who was a successful lawyer and businessman in Baton Rouge during the days of Jim Crow, never even questioning that black people had to sit in another part of church, or black people couldn't drink from the same water fountains, or that black kids had to make their first Holy Communion and Sacred Heart Church separate from white kids. Didn't question it, because that's what culture does to us. And I was so glad to be awake. I'm still glad to be awake. And when you think of it, you can't make yourself wake up. You can't say, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and I'm going to be enlightened. When our soul awakens, then it's always gift. And I'm awake, and I awake, and I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects, and the people of St. Thomas, whom I had only known as our servants when I'm growing up as a white privileged kid, became my teachers. And I learned about the criminal justice system and what happens when you're brought to jail. And the young people calling us, calling us the sisters, there who lived in the apartment said to people, sister, they won't let me out on my own recognizance. Will you speak up for me? Watching what happened as the police beat up this young person right in front of us and hauled him off in the police car. And he yells to the nuns on the porch of Hope House before they took him off. Sisters, y'all are my witness. I got no drugs on me. And then Fah went into the jail. And a young, beautiful black man that would be saved by two white women who get in there and speak up for him. And then I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to a man on death row. And he wrote back. And the relationship began. His name is Patrick Sonia. He's the first story <coughs> in this book. And he was killed two years later by the state of Louisiana in the electric chair. And I was there. And it changed me. Just to witness it. I'm writing a spiritual memoir now called River of Fire. It's like a prequel to that. It's what preceded this journey. It's a spiritual memoir. And I'm going to begin it this way. It's called River Fire. River because life moves. Fire because hopefully we are a passion to catch on fire, which is what happened to me. And we'll begin with this prelude. They killed a man with fire one night. They strapped him in a wooden chair and pumped electricity through his body until he was dead. His killing was a legal act because he had killed. No religious leaders protested the killing that night, but I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And what I saw set my soul on fire, a fire that burns in me still. And now here's an account how I came to be in the killing chamber that night and the spiritual currents that brought me there. Any of the students who have stepped into a prison, if you're there for a class, you're there to visit, and in your eyes look into the eyes of another human being who has been incarcerated, maybe for life, maybe for a long time, and when our eyes meet with that other human being, that experience, though it may not be as dramatic as killing someone in an electric chair, but that steady assault on the dignity and the life and vivacity of the person is steadily honed down. And then one day, there's a visit. There's a presence. It's really obvious what the prisoners get out visitors coming and the young people coming for inside out that do classes that need the thing. Is it as obvious to us of what happens to us when we are in the presence of people who've been thrown down this hole without agency, without much freedom? Sometimes maybe being felt feeling like they're in the curve of a river or a current of a river going over a waterfall. 
almost from the time of birth and childhood and what happens in the family. And it's like there they are in the current. And what happens to us when we encounter them? And maybe when we get out of the prison for the first time or we want to take a shower and we want to be clean and just so good to be free, so good to be able to go get a pizza if I want, see a movie if I want, freedom, and feel the freedom. But maybe it's going to haunt us and we're going to think about them. And, and what was presented to us tonight so tangibly, so really, all the presentations that are there, where we get a little glimpse of all those in solitary sticking their legs through the food slots, that maybe the one coming with the camera is going to touch their leg or take a picture of their leg. Because we desire to be somehow. We've made a tremendous potential for greatness and goodness and to see that clamp down, all but snuffed out. Patrick Sonia was the first person I encountered to execution. I didn't know that his death was going to unleash in me a fire, and that from then on, I would be getting in airplanes, I would be writing books, I would be working with people to make films, I would be working with people to make operas, to get the story out to wake up the American people, because it's a hidden reality from us. And if you hide suffering of human beings from us, we can do anything to them behind bars. What is going to change prisons? What will give us a day in the future when we do not live in a lockdown, imprisoned population in this country in such huge numbers is because of the presence of people who are going to scream in like us and meet real human beings, and we, are with them, are going to be the agents of change. We never meet them, we never look into their eyes, we only read about them, we only look at videos, we only look at DVDs. It is their presence that changes us. And so we have to be creative in every way we know to do that. The second book that I wrote, The Death of Innocence, and we'll, be, I'll, we'll have the books out here for you, but I'll be happy to sign them for you. Uh, the books are $15 and you can them. This book I never dreamed was going to happen because I kept visiting people on death row and finding out that more and more of them were innocent. I've accompanied seven people. Manuel Ortiz is the seventh person that I've been with on death row. Three out of the seven are innocent. And this story is about two innocent people. And it's going to break your heart. Especially Dobie's story. We had an IQ of 65, an African-American man railroaded through a trial where the prosecutor presented a scenario of a crime that you are not going to believe and an all-white jury that sentenced Dobie to death. And then he was brought to the death house three times, got within an hour and a half of death twice before he was killed by the state. And we don't have a Supreme Court that recognizes that the death penalty is the practice of torture. They refuse to acknowledge that taking a conscious, imaginative human being, putting him in a cell, 20 years, 15 years, and taking him out and killing him, or bringing him right to death's door, and then turning around saying, not tonight, Billy. Go back to your cell. And then a month later, he's brought to die. And again, the same thing happens. And he's sent back to his cell. And then he's brought in the next week to be killed. And he says to me, Sister Helen, I need it to be over. The saying goodbye to his mother, the wrenching apart of families, the suffering of mothers leaving their children, the Texas death killing chamber where there are three witnessing chambers, one for the public witnesses, 12 witnesses look out on the gurney. Opposite that, up elevated with the head of the person, even with the head of the person, being killed is where the victim's representative send two representatives from the family to watch as the kill, as the state kills the one who killed their loved one, they get to watch. And that third witnessing chamber looking down into the face of the person on the gurney is where mothers have put their hands against that glass and watched as the state killed their children. 
Can we see the slow death that's eked out behind the prison walls in that cell without the dramatic thing of strapping someone in a chair or on a gurney? The slow death of human beings being eked out in that small space. Can we sense it? Can we be moved by it? Can we stand up and say, I'll go. I'll go. And let me see where that current is going to take my boat. You don't have to have it all figured out before you start to act to justice. Just go there. Expose yourself to it. Open yourself to it. Meet people there. And see then what happens to your heart. What happens to your heart. It will bring you up against all the gifts and protections and all that we've been given. I just also like a fire in us. Every other month, who have been sent, that we are the ones who are going to make a difference, that we are the ones who will hear the poet Rilke's words, more is required than being swept along, that we will be the ones who will resist, that we will be the ones who begin to create the alternative. We are the ones, we'll be the ones who will be transformed. So what a privilege to be with you. All of you, all of you in this endeavor. So few people venture behind the walls to see the reality of human lives thrown away like disposable human lives. What a difference education makes in a prison. What a difference it makes to have a book and to see a human soul spark and come alive from ideas, from conversation, from dialogue from meeting with other human beings. And what a gift for us. What a gift for us to be blind. How do I try to describe to you that this work that I'm doing has made me more alive than anything I've known in my life? And that when we're stretched, and when we cross those boundaries, and when we're unsure, and we get in there in community with other people, we come alive. It saves our life. And I'll end with the quote that I began with. If you've come to help me, no thanks. If you've come because you realize your liberation is tied to mine, well. So now we can have some conversation together. So peace <laughs> or uh, a comment that you might just line up and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, sister, for being here tonight. Thank you, sister. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, not everyone in this room comes from a previous background, and I'm one such person. My husband, he was a husband at the time, and he's been incarcerated in the state of at least three times. One time for almost five years, along with also being incarcerated in the county jail. I have five sons, and every day, I'm just hoping that they make it home safely. And for people who don't understand that reality, I mean, you think about the work that you've been doing for as many years as you've been doing, along with many others. But then my question is, what does it take for people to really understand when it's not their reality. You know, from the African American community, you hear, especially now with the police shootings, you say you hear people say all the time, when they shot them down the street like a dog. There's no way people would be shooting dogs down. There would be a, a national outcry if dogs were being shot the way that our sons and husbands are being killed. And even females, even elderly people are being so it's hard for me to believe that enough people care because if they did, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be going on. So I, you know, I really wonder, and I'm very angry, and I really wonder as a society, what are we really thinking? Or how do we really feel? 
And then when we talked about punishment, the bankers, the the head corporation that who nobody feels that they should be punished. You know, it's 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 it's, it's the, the 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 basis of who's being punished and why. Until we have those real conversations, in my opinion, it's not going to change. And I just, I just can't believe it. I see a lot of people who say they care, but I, 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 don't, I don't see evidence of it. Because if enough people cared, it would come to a stop. Let me ask you this. About your sons, are they able to go to a, a school? Are they able to get their feet on the ground? Are they able to make strides? To be able to grow and to live? They are, but every day you don't know if they're going to make it home. You don't know if it's the gangs or the police going to get it. So every day, you you're, you're live in fear every day. So what, what kind of life is that? Because if they really felt free, I think they could make much bigger strides. I'm so I'm grateful for the strides that they're able to make. Yeah. I have girlfriends, I know about four people whose sons are incarcerated. I mean, this is just the reality for us. And it seems to be acceptable, not only from us, but for the rest of society as well. So I'm angry on both ends. I'm angry about the African American community who seems to seem that it's okay. I'm even more angry with them. But just in general, this is just like a regular situation, and I, I don't know. I'm just very frustrated. Let me ask you this. In stating your frustration and all your fears and all to us today, what do you look for? I look for people to be able to start having a real conversation about privilege and white supremacy. And for people to own that. The, but it's, I, I, oh, I guess I want people to really care about one another on the most basic level, but I, I don't really see that. I, I, I think it's the society's conditioning, but I would like to see people, as you, as you spoke about going into the prisons and just seeing that person, you know, there's so much separation, right? You know, mm -hmm. I want us to see one another as, I mean, how do you see a dog more important than a human being? And believe me, animals are important as well. I mean, it's life, no, really but, yeah. yes, but how can you, you know, when they show them on TV at night in the cage, maybe if they start showing the prisons yeah. in the cages, maybe people would have some compassion for that, but there's no compassion. I don't know, I don't begin to know how to answer their sorrow and their sorrow. I don't. But we're in a room full of people here tonight, and we're here with students and all, who maybe some people want to respond to this. All I know is that when we wake up, we gotta get in there and we gotta be with people, and we can't. I know the separation is one of the huge things. As long as I was in the summer, I didn't know there was police brutality going on against people. I wasn't scared of police. I didn't know what was happening to kids in these public schools where they could get to be a junior in high school and they couldn't read a third grade reader. I had gone to good Catholic school. And so when you separate it like that, you don't even know what's going on. But when we wake up and we got people with good hearts in this room, and this is a good university, that's really making strides in to understand what the problems are so that young people can get engaged to be able to make changes and not just to live off that privilege, but to cross boundaries and to go into prisons and to go into the neighborhoods. And I mean, I know what they're doing in some of these classes here. And these are good people. You are issuing an invitation and it's coming out of your deep suffering with a long history of suffering coming all the way up from we know the days when the Klan hung people, the lynchings, and the slavery just out of the whole bit. So when we encounter each other like we're doing tonight, your words, though we may not be able to, nobody in this room maybe can give you an answer tonight of exactly what's going to be done. But I want to sense with you that your words are being heard and received. And before you leave here, talk to people. And people, what's your name? Francis. But I actually have to go back to class. I'm supposed to be in class. <laughs> <laughs> Francis, we don't want to keep you from class. 
but you made an eloquent plea, and what you did was you voiced the suffering and the complexity of it all. So thank you. I'll be back on the 8th. I think you said on the 8th and the 12th. On the 8th? Okay, Francis, you won't be back. I will. Okay, great. Thank you so much. participating in this. What's happened? What's happened to you? What questions do you have? Or anybody? Or to the students? Understanding as to why someone else is 
different life, or their perspective may be different. Thank so, you. Thank you know what? We started out in a culture, well, in a, it, just even the way our faith has often been interpreted, is that we fell from grace in the garden, and we were driven out of the garden of Eden, and we were punished. So punishment is what we live with. You are punished for the bad things you do. And so we have places of punishment. We tend to operate out of that. Imagine having a creation story where you don't have a fall where automatically you're being driven into punishment and into pain for what you have done. What's your step, sir? Uh, my name is uh, Bert Canada, and uh, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Uh, I'm in the philosophy and social change class. For, we're going to Austin Community, we're building a community garden. And uh, what I really take away from everything you've done is uh, I really admire your creativity and how you put that to work. And it's kind of like what we're doing in our class. We're taking our own talents and trying to put them back in the community and have a cohesive relationship. Where it's anything you really done with confidence and the right education, and that's what's really black in this community. It's just the confidence is something that kind of helped along the way. Did you say a community garden? And that's correct. Can you talk about your garden? And who's working in this garden? And what are you growing in this garden? Oh, uh, Professor Mo right here is, uh, he's, she's leading it, and uh, we've got every Wednesday and Saturday. Uh, last week we passed out flyers. Uh, it's, it's crazy, just like, my neighborhood, we don't have culture, so people in, inside the doors. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of changing my view of, like, I've lived in Chicago, but like, I've never seen the West Side, you know? And uh, it's just taking what I've had a programmer, so I'm trying to educate people in the community and I'm reach out via the website of Faith Inc. Trying to get the you know, community aware that anyone can learn program. You know, it's it's not steep curves. Yeah. You know, it's just realizing that you have talents to share with other people. And mm -hmm. really, what you've done is you you know you're books, and it's all that fire you're talking about is the talents inside mm -hmm. you that you put to work. So thank you very much. Thank you, community garden. We want to talk about a step away from separation and a community garden where people work in a community garden. Somebody over here had something to say too. You want to stand up? And then you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, we're students with the Inside Out program at Tango and Cook County. And we I mean, not just us, but a lot of us in this room share that same frustration of what do we do. Wait, speak steadily into the mic because you dropped your voice. <laughs> but they put it right up to your mouth and belt it out. <laughs> First of all, uh, we all share that same frustration. What we are doing though, is what this system does is take value away from the human being. And I think in the most simplest way I can say it, and when we were there two weeks ago, uh, one of our guys said, like, it's crazy that you put value on like, that you show us that they, they were doing, imagine a life that you really feel like no one in this world values your presence and your being and your ability. So having these conversations, and I wish Joyce was here because we would really reflect strongly, Francis is here, I would really reflect strongly on that historical harm that devalues the blood. And um, so this continuing, and continuing to show up to these events, and continuing to hear these guys' voices because they deserve to be heard is a really strong step. And then what you take from this and bring it out to your own personal community Thank you very much. Okay, who else? Steps. Hi. Uh, um, so, what really stood out to me from your speech um, was connecting with those who are in the prison. However, what started coming into my mind was like, you don't know someone in the prison, it's kind of seen as if you're not allowed in it. And unfortunately, like one of my biggest regrets is not being for this inside out program. It sounds like a really good program. Um, so, for me, I 
Okay, students, everybody. How does somebody start to get into a prison? This is inside out program. What else can you do? What are the steps? Who knows? Y'all can line up at that mic. You don't have to wait till one finishes serially and then another one gets. We look, we talk about concrete stuff that people are doing. Yes? My name is Peggy. I'm a senior citizen in this community. Um, when I was in college, in medical school at Washington University in St. Louis, um, I was involved with prison ministry with the Newman Center. Um, and we started by going and asked just to have someone that knew the responses to guide the people. And that's how we started making connections with people. Um, that then led, since I was working in occupational therapy, um, I was working with people at St. Louis Street in my profession, where we would go into the projects, and the um, women were only allowed to work with the young women. We weren't allowed to be around the men. But what we did is we would establish a big sister relationship with the uh, girls that lived in the projects because frequently by the end of the month they were subsisting on two-year-old cups and potatoes because they didn't know how to manage it. So we would take them into the store, the grocery store, and we would talk about buying a box of sugar-coated frost flakes versus a box of oatmeal and how it would spread differently. We would, you know, um, explore looking at the newspapers in the library to find out what places were free to go to. We would learn how to ride buses in different places. Um, we, okay. would organize, okay. we, would, we would organize uh, neighborhood trash pickup. We would went to different businessmen. We got donations and things and we would take and we'd take the trash and we made paper mache bracelets and all types of things like this, which is showing on the web. Mm -hmm. And those steps, that's how that's how you can start by sitting, you know, with a thing they went. And it was very disconcerting because I mean when you go into somebody's house and you come out of the and other ones said like you don't want to take this to the dog. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's one thing that you're making a big That's all very concrete stuff with little sisters, yes. My thought is concrete. It's kind of secondhand advice from the men that I got to know through the Inside Out program. Uh, my name is Mandy, and I was in the first Inside Out class uh, with Professor Mel a few years ago. And I was with these men through my whole struggle of not knowing I was going to graduate soon and not knowing what that was supposed to mean or what it was supposed to look like or what I was going to do. And I'm in law school now. And they were a big part of helping me decide on that. Mm -hmm. And what one of the men said to me was, you know, you've just got to figure out what your purpose is. You've got to figure out where your strengths, your talent, where your strengths and talents, your passion, and the risks you're willing to take intersect. And wherever that intersection is, then you go from there. And you find that intersection, and then that leads you to those next steps. And so when it comes to wanting to get involved with something like this, there's not necessarily, at least not that I'm aware of, if you're aware of one, I'd love to know, but like one set of steps you're supposed to follow, one set of things that if everybody hits buttons one, two, and three, we'll get rid of the prison system as we know it. I don't think it's, it works like that. I think it's just finding, everybody finds an intersection on their own, and it's like everybody kind of puts one step forward for taking this wheel spin around, and eventually we'll get something. But, which is kind of an abstract answer, like doesn't really answer your question, but I think it's just that there's not one thing we can all be doing. It's just we've got to all figure out what it is that you're supposed to be doing on our own with this purpose in mind and go from there. But are you, so what you're saying when you were talking with the ones on the inside, they helped you talk inside yourself what it is you needed to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Somebody else? Thank you. Uh, my name is Patrice, and I'm from Illinois State. I came up with a couple of my graduate students. Um, 
prepared a, a seminar on asylum and human rights. And I just want to step, it kind of builds on what you're doing. The things that unfold to you and you don't, you don't anticipate them. Um, this is a research seminar. It's supposed to be extremely awful experience for all the graduate students. And so I pitched in on asylum and human rights because I do a lot of pro bono work for um, Mexicans, Peruvians, Ecuadorians who would be returned, killed or tortured if they were returned to their country of origin. So I taught them the nuts and bolts of asylum law and um, like what is a credible fear interview and that kind of thing and all kinds of really cool stuff. And what they turned around and did, and this is my student Becker hiding from me now, is um, contacted some pro bono lawyers down in Texas. We were all anchored, anchored at the new developments in punishment, that is the criminalization of Central American moms and kids who come in without documentation. And now they're being held in Carnes, Texas, under a for-profit prison. That sounds unspeakable, isn't it? It is unspeakable. And uh, men's human rights violations. And so what we're doing, thanks to my graduate students' initiative, and they felt the calling, is we're going down to support the pro bono lawyers yes. as interpreters, as yes. we're, we're history nerds, so we are doing the background briefing for their asylum appeals and people write the briefs for them. So we'll all get our own little stitch in. But I'm so angered at the corporatization of punishment. Sister Helen, if you could speak about that briefly. I don't well, know you but you're the one teaching us about that. Just the per diem, they get what, $99 a day? Even more. Even more. It, it's obscene. Um, the current site was the site of um, internment of Japanese Americans. Years ago, so that is the site of, of much pain. How do we find the, the corporatization? Which say you get in there, you teach. You learn, you get pro bono lawyers. I mean, when people come to me for help, I go, I've got to get a lawyer somewhere. They need a lawyer. we got to get them a lawyer. Richard Glossop in Oklahoma, we got to get a pro bono attorney to a successor petition. You start learning the law. You start learning what you need. You start looking for resources. Because you're determined to resist this. I will not accept that this is happening to these people. And then in my country, the next thing you know, you're there with a group of people and you're digging in and you're getting in there. And then it is going to, in Latin America, the expression is, the path is made by walking. You don't have all that blueprint laid out of every step you're going to do. Just get in there and do it. Where are your students here tonight? Y'all, wave your hands. Let's see you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks for coming. All right, maybe just one last question. A comment? You're up. <laughs> You're up. You're in. Hi, uh, my name is Lana. I'm actually in the current class at Stateville, um, but we've only been inside once so far. Okay. Yeah. We always want to know a lot every time you go there, so um, yeah. excited to learn. Um, but I wanted to put forward an idea um, that's helped me. Uh, the act of naming things, what we really are. So the way that I came to this navigation was an idea was hearing someone name our system is not the um, justice system, but as a criminal punishment system. Yeah. And that, for me, is what created the domino effect of understanding how things really work. Um, it's also been important for me for someone who uh, identifies as a feminist and an activist to identify and name carceral feminism that supports a punitive for-profit carceral system rather than working within communities and working for um, more restorative and, and um, growth, and helping the goal of growth instead of um, But it's also been important for me just to recognize my privilege as people have also spoken about today, um, which is obviously important, but to recognize what it means to go into a community that's not our own, um, and to see the difference between helping and supporting, um, and the difference between a band-aid, which is always very beautiful and very nice, and can be like the little step for somebody else, but um, the difference between that and true change that comes from within the community itself. Um, so I don't know when Stateville will, you know, class itself, 
More of these kind of things happen. <laughs> but I, I just want to put that forward as the um, maybe one of the final steps that I want to look forward to instead of um, you know just the little things. Is what? Instead of just all the little things that, that yeah, we have to do. You know what? I mean, I'm mean, I'll end with this too. When we look at the whole picture of things and it's just so overwhelming and there's so much wrong and we have so far to go. The minute we put our hands on the road and take the smallest action in the direction of justice, you will be amazed how liberating it is. The hardest thing is not acting. The hardest thing is trying to plan all the possible moves. But that hand on that road and pulling on that road and taking that one step, and then it leads to the next. Action is liberating. Thinking it all in our head and trying to work out a plan makes us collapse inside. It's very depressing. The minute we begin to act, we begin to be afraid. And then we act with others. We find others in the community and act together. And then we're on our way. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful evening.